And with that, I'd like to introduce the moderator for the uh, 2030 uh, in maternal health uh, session. Uh, the moderator is uh, uh, Laurie Zephrin. Laurie is the Vice President of Healthcare Delivery System Reform at the Commonwealth Fund. She's a board certified OBGYN and uh, had completed her residency training at Harvard Integrated Residency Program at Brigham and Women Hospitals and Mass General Hospital. Um, Lori um, continued her experience as a clinician, a health policy maker, a health system innovator, and also has a key role at the Commonwealth Fund to drive delivery uh, system change. Dr. Zephrin uh, was first the, at the first national director of the Reproductive Health Program at the Department of uh, Veteran Affairs. Uh, she spearheaded strategic vision and leading system change to policy and improve health for women veterans nationwide. She also served as the acting as, uh, assistant deputy under Secretary for Health for Community Care and later as acting deputy under Secretary for Health and uh, Community Care. Dr. Zephyrin, welcome to the conference. Thank you, and um, thanks so much. Really, really excited to um, to hear from you. And thanks for leading us in in terms of who will be born in 2020 or 2030. Well, 2020 is now in 2030. And so we, you know, we have a really exciting panel today. And this has just been a great, a great conference. Thank you, Yol, for the introduction. Really appreciate it. Um, so today we're going to talk about the future of maternal health as we're totally ready to say bye to 2020. Um, and we'll hear from our panelists on where they see innovations in maternal health for people in 2030. What a year we've had in 2020, COVID-19 pandemic, racial inequity and systemic racism unveiled. Um, and maternal health really should be front and center. Um, as you all have heard in prior panels, maternal health in the US is shocking. Um, and the US is last compared to our counterparts in other high income countries with these striking racial disparities. And even looking at data in Pittsburgh where this conference Lift PGH is hosted, you know, despite starting prenatal care earlier than black women in similar cities, uh, black women's maternal mortality in Pittsburgh is higher than 97% of similar cities. So there's a lot to discuss and on really thinking of opportunities for how to reverse this trend. We have three wonderful panelists today who are leading innovators in femtech and maternal health. Dr. Neil Shah, OBGYN, professor at Harvard, directory of the Delivery Session Decisions Initiative at Harvard's Ariadne Labs. Dr. Tamar Krishnamurti, founder and CEO of Naima Health and assistant Pref professor of medicine and clinical translation sciences at the University of Pittsburgh and Bethany Edwards, CEO and co-founder of Leah Diagnostics. So, Welcome to all of you and thank you for joining me today for this conversation. Um, Neil, you're at the forefront of design and system change in maternal health. Can you set the stage for us? Tell about us about um, birthing in the US today and where you'll see changes by 2030. Are you on mute? What? Well, uh, Hey, Neil, did you hear me? Um, I missed last thing. Did you just cue me up? Oh, awesome. No, no problem. Perfect timing. So I was saying, uh, Neil, can you sort of, um, you're at the forefront of design and system change. Can you set the stage for us? Tell us about birthing in the US today, 2020, and where you'll see changes. You think we'll see changes by 2030. Sure thing, Dr. Zephyrin, thank you. And I, I, um, I'm here in the hospital right now um, in 2020, which feels like a real inflection point. It's, that was the reason for my, my firewall issue that made me drop out for a second as well. But you know, I'm, I'm here in the middle of this awful, everything about 2020, the pandemic, but also on the day that vaccinations are rolling out. And it's a reminder to me uh, actually that um, people who are pregnant are vulnerable biologically, uh, socially, um, and they deserve priority and protection, but in so many ways they do not get it, uh, even when it comes to vaccination testing and vaccination guidelines. But uh, maybe I'll just start by casting a little bit of a vision for 2030 compared to the starting place that you mentioned, uh, which is that um, ideally by 2030, we'll be living in a world and a country uh, in which every person can choose to grow their family with dignity. And childbirth will be seen as not just a transient episode in the lives of some people, but as the foundational episode in the lives of all people. Um, in many ways, the well-being of people who are giving birth 
is a bellwether for the well-being of all of us. So we know that if uh, you know birthing people are unwell, uh, society is unwell. And the way that we know that is because pretty much every injustice in society shows up in the well-being of people giving birth, whether it is racism um, uh, and the fact that um, the disparities that you outlined uh, in Pittsburgh and in so many cities across the country uh, seem to stand irrespective of education or income, particularly for Black people and Native people, uh, whether it's misogyny, whether it's xenophobia, and whether it's even generational justice. Um, so, so much of the last year has been animated by the presidential campaigns and their themes. And honestly, whether it's making America great again or building America back better, there's this idea that well-being in our country is eroding right now. And we see this in maternal health too. An American today is 50% more likely to die in childbirth than her own mother was. Um, and um, that is an awful place to start. That's why we're at the bottom. I think that we can get to that vision though. And I think among the many things when I look out across our country right now that give me hope is the unbelievable momentum that we have to improve things in maternal health from a system design perspective, as well as from a policy perspective. We have a black maternal health caucus. We have a vice president elect who was the sponsor of some of those bills. We have momentum to extend Medicaid and we have uh, the focused energy of uh, the Jewish Healthcare Foundation uh, the city of Pittsburgh, uh, and uh, so many others to try to make a difference. Thanks, Neil. Thanks, Neil. Excellent, excellent points. Tamar, your work is really at the intersection of innovation and social good. And we talked a little bit in the beginning about, you know, where, where we are in Pittsburgh in terms of the disproportionate high numbers. So tell us about the problems you're trying to solve in maternal health today. How did you go from identifying the problem to developing the solutions and then look forward into the next decade and where do you see your work um, being 10 years from now? Yeah, so, I mean, I think that we, um, so I, I, there's a co-founding team for our company and our product uh, that consists of me. I'm a behavioral scientist, so I you know, study communication and decision-making. I have a colleague who does applied statistics and machine learning and a maternal fetal medicine physician. And we, we really came together initially to think about um, how we could better communicate with pregnant people about the complex issue of preterm births because you know information is power. So how do we put that information in people's hands so that they can use it, um, empower themselves with their own pregnancy process? Um, and so we came together because we wanted to build a platform that could be used in communities that are under-resourced just as one small step to try and start to address some of these disparities. And, in care uh, that are highlighted by some of the pretty abysmal numbers that we have in Pittsburgh. Um, and so, you know, that when we first started our work, it was designed mostly as a communication tool, but it's really evolved over time. Over the last five years, we've been able to incorporate some machine learning techniques into our work and, and offer kind of more personalized risk predictions for people that are using it. So the tool itself consists of a patient facing app uh, that collects information from pregnant people in between their routine prenatal care visits. It offers education, it offers risk reduction actions, and then it offers connection to local resources in real time in response to the information that we collect. Um, and then there's also a provider facing portal that's integrated with medical records that helps alert providers to risks that are identified through the app. Um, and the focus for us is really on how do we collect information and do something about modifiable risk factors. So the things that we see that are amenable to social, behavioral and clinical supports. Um, so we model any given app user's likelihood of, of having a preterm birth or a related adverse event based on modifiable risk factors. And then we connect them in that moment that we're detecting risk to the kinds of supports that are either in the health system or in the community that can decrease maternal health risks in a more timely way than you would be able to do with routine prenatal care. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, you know, we're, we're focusing on these modifiable risk factors, but in a lot of ways, the problems we're trying to solve are being driven by how people interact with technology. So there are some things that people may be more comfortable disclosing to technology than they would in an actual interaction with their healthcare provider or there are circumstances in their lives that make it easier to share that information through the layer of technology before they seek a social support. Um, and so 
you know, we're able to kind of share resources for problems like that, that may otherwise be missed. Um, Right. And I think, oh, sorry, go ahead. Great. No, that, yeah. that's, that's amazing. Thanks. Yeah. And I realize, um, you know, in, you know, what's what, what, I, what I was loving about Naima Health, you say designed by doctors, scientists and mothers. And so it also sounds like you're also centering moms in the in this design as well. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think um, you, you can't have a communication or a technology or a tool of any kind that's going to be effective if you can't bring people on board. So there's a a tension between offering clinical support and engaging people. How do you be the Twitter of healthcare, but offer something that's that's really um, that's really actionable and that's grounded in science? And so, you know, I think that's that's something that we're really working on. We've we brought women, um, pregnant people, I should say, in from the beginning, and they will continue to drive the direction of the technology and how how the design you know evolves. Fantastic. Thanks. Twitter of healthcare. I like, I like that. <laughs> Bethany, um, so you've created something that's never existed in the world before. Pretty amazing. So can you tell us like what created the opportunity for Leah and what additional opportunities do you see in the next decade? Yeah, sure. So first of all, uh, you know, Leah is the first FDA cleared flushable 100% biodegradable pregnancy test. And it was built really around, uh, I'll, <laughs> I'll show it a little bit. Thank you, that's great. Uh, it's, it's all paper, no plastic. And it was built around, you know, three key insights. The first one being that the at-home pregnancy test has been the same stiff uh, plastic relic for over 30 years. And it's crazy to really reflect on that because the 1980s, the first cell phone, the boom box, the Apple personal computer and the at-home pregnancy test were all launched. But if you look at all of those innovations, they've all made significant strides, except for the at-home pregnancy test. It's still the same, you know, stiff, like I mentioned, you know, plastic relic, basically, that's been highlighted in movies for its lack of privacy. You know, somebody sees it in the trash and they announce the news before you can. You know, they're notably bulky. Um, they're obviously problematic from a sustainability standpoint. They're adding over more than 2 million pounds of plastic plastic waste to landfills each year just in the US, which is enough plastic to stretch from here to the International Space Station and back about seven times. And, and that's just pregnancy tests. Um, that doesn't even get into ovulation tests or other single use diagnostics. You know, second, um, there are obviously unmet needs around privacy and sustainability. So pregnancy and pregnancy testing is personal. And we, you know, you guys were alluding to that. And over 92% of women we found really value privacy when taking a pregnancy test. And that's regardless of whether there are hopeful negatives or hopeful positives, or if they even fall into this kind of unusual category of being unsure, which actually represents a fair amount of women. That is something that isn't talked about a lot. I mean, there's been studies that have shown that that could be up to 22% of people taking tests at any given time. Time. And so obviously privacy is really paramount for these, these people and these patients. And, you know, it, it could be just a matter of um, you know, testing at work or struggling to conceive and not wanting to see a pile of plastic tests pile up in, a, in the trash can because that's a heart-wrenching reminder for a lot of people. And so, you know, we really wanted to hit this privacy angle and by overlaying new materials and um, innovative coatings that we've developed, we've been able to eliminate all glass fibers, all plastic, all nitrocellulose from the product, which therefore allows allows it to meet all the flushability and all the biodegradability guidelines. Um, you know, I always like to show this because I think it, it's, it's, so it's so impactful. This is, this is soil and it's what's left of a LEA test after eight weeks in soil. And I mean, there's, there's, a, there's nothing there, right? And that, that's just pretty powerful to me. And those studies have been conducted for us by third party labs. And so we know that we're really meeting that 100% biodegradability claim. 
Um, and you know, the, the third thing I would just say is that we also recognized that there was an opportunity in the marketplace to not only have a novel um, product innovation, but also to be a disruptive brand in the category and to really open up a conversation that nobody else was tackling. You know, the, the fact that we have our packaging, you can either purchase it in an all white unbranded, non-branded packaging to keep that privacy element, or our branded one has this little expletive on it, which, which you know, it's a, it's a little nod to, to the honesty um, and this idea of, you know, over 99% accurate, 0% plastic and 100% your business has been really something that we've wanted to, to really bring to the forefront and to start a new conversation around in the pregnancy test space and in the women's health space in general. Awesome. Thanks, Bethany. That's that's amazing. Neil, can you tell us what are the right things to invest in from a maternal health care perspective, just also given your work? Sure. I would love to have the platform to talk about that. <laughs> um, you know, I, I think the, the first thing is that we need to just reframe our thinking around birth. Um, it uh, is often treated as a cost. That's certainly the way our healthcare system is designed. Um, you know, labor and delivery units functionally, whether they're at McGee or anywhere else, even though McGee is probably the one of the most beautiful hospitals I've ever been to, um, you know, they tend to be top heavy. Um, it, and uh, that's not because the service is invaluable. It's because we don't value it enough. Um, it doesn't make sense that we should have the same cost structure as the cardiac ICU and the fraction of the reimbursement for birthing people. So we've got to rethink um, the, the opportunity to treat childbirth as an investment and then when we do it, we, we have to think about investment in technology. Of course, we've got to think about the systems that that technology sits upon because every system is perfectly designed to get the results that it gets. And our system is designed to get the results that we mentioned. Uh, and what that really means is investing materially on meeting people, uh, not just within the four walls of our hospitals or the four walls of our healthcare system, but in the communities where they live their lives. Out in the city of Pittsburgh where uh, they uh, need and deserve uh, social support around all of the needs that contribute to having a healthy pregnancy. Um, and it means investing in our structures, which only public policy can do. Uh, and I'm, I'm just really glad that after, um, you know, despite the fact that our payment systems for, for childbirth have been balkanized across 50 Medicaid systems, uh, thanks to the Commonwealth Fund and a lot of other uh, actors in the space right now, there's a lot of attention being paid to the role of Medicaid extension and um, manage Medicaid to do some really innovative policy making and uh, make sure that people are getting the care that they that they need and the access that they need. Awesome, thank you. And it, it sounds like, you know, your point around the systems designed to get the results, um, the results it gets, it, it's key. And I think that also links to innovation. And, you know, Bethany, you were talking about just developing something new and you know you mentioned the boom box and I remember the boom box I don't know if I'm aging myself but um you know it's to to sort of link those two thoughts like who is designing the system who's at the table I think you had given us uh, when we talked an example of the breast pump for example and sort of you know so just share with us you know what does it take to change these systems and and innovate in a space where it's sorely needed yeah, um, you know, one of the, the interesting facts that I've found now kind of several years into this is that it, it takes on average anywhere from seven to nine years to take um, a, mar a medical device from idea to commercialization. And so that's a real chunk of time. And you're, you got to really plan on, you know, the pitfalls of that, the challenges associated with manufacturing, I think, are one of the biggest things that, that we face on the medical device side as far as innovations go. Um, you know, I think that the other big thing in terms of additional innovation opportunities kind of in this next decade is, you know, we're going to continue to build off of these trends around self and remote monitoring. I mean, that's going to continue. The pandemic has obviously accelerated telehealth and telemedicine. And the winning connected experiences that monitor the patient's journey will be ones that private, um, prioritize privacy and care. And, you know, I do think there's going to be this more deliberate, um, 
you know, greater knowledge being built around couples and couples fertility. There's obviously a lot of at-home diagnostic tools that are happening that are empowering women and men and couples, you know, to understand their fertility more. And there will be continue to be innovations there, as well as um, this kind of shared responsibility among gender roles. And I think that's going to open up a lot of new products that allow for dual child care, regardless of parent gender, which is an area that I'm pretty excited about as well, in addition to just this, how do you overlap kind of technology and monitoring and the really unique insights that you get from that, along with kind of more sustainable um, product, um, kind of, you know, you can quickly go through commodities on the product side, but how can you take also advantage of, of the data that you're gathering to, to really give informed insights? Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. No, that's 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 really helpful. And you know, as we think of all the innovation that's out there, Bethany, you sort of highlighted just you know the the increase in telehealth and use in telehealth out of necessity, but how we see how we've seen how helpful that is in in providing care and also showing how we can actually change care models and and hopefully make it better for people. Um, and Tamar, there's so many apps out there and so so much innovation out there and. I mean, just so much in the in the maternity space, just in the last I don't know five years right now, and so um, and so how do you how do you achieve social good? How do you balance one off innovations versus scale? What do you say to people who say you know we have enough apps for pregnancy, we still have high maternal mortality? What what do you say to, to those people? Um, yeah, I, I would agree. <laughs> I think we probably have enough of a certain kind of pregnancy app on the market already. Um, I don't think we have enough that works well to identify patients who are at risk. I don't think we have enough that appropriately connects patients to resources in a way that's accessible, that's personalized. I mean, I think, uh, you know, a lot of the kind of products that exist today are designed to be engaging. They're fun. You learn what size fruit your baby is that week, Um, but they don't have the mission and kind of sophistication, a lot of them to kind of predict potential risks that can result in maternal morbidity or mortality. So they're not really addressed for that. Their business model is um, to collect data on moms and sell it to advertisers, you know, connecting them to discounts for baby gear. And, you know, that's a business model we're all familiar with in this, you know, in the world that we operate in. Lots of people are comfortable with it. Um, It's not a business model that I personally am interested in. I think, you know, I think there's a real responsibility for us to build tools and and invest in technology that go beyond kind of selling things to health literate, socioeconomically privileged, relatively healthy white women. And I think we have a responsibility and a space to make things that are addressing, going beyond that business model, beautiful and engaging and um, and valuable to people. So, Mm -hmm. you know. Yeah, no, thank you. That's that's an excellent point around, particularly around, um, you know, sort of a lot of these apps and technologies, you know, are marketed to a particular person or, or a group of people. And so how do you how do you also broaden that market? And Neil, you mentioned earlier around, you know, extending Medicaid and the work beha- behind that as well. How do we um, ensure these t- technologies can also be extended to people on Medicaid or also or also just me be more broadly culturally um, um, responsive to just the broad range of cultures we, we have out there? We can do that by being intentional and by deciding to do it. I think, um, you know, part of why this moment feels like an inflection point, um, uh, not because just the vaccines are arriving and we can see the light at the end of the tunnel, but I think, um, you know, nine months into this, we've seen that actually uh, the ways in which the COVID-19 pandemic has disrupted healthcare services has created opportunities for innovation because we've had the same set of challenges across the country uh, and we've had to respond to it. And whether it's Medicaid or anything else, we have 50 natural experiments for Medicaid uh, policy. We have uh, natural experiments for prenatal care after having a 100 year old model that has been fixed uh, for the whole last century. We're suddenly revisiting it in the setting of telehealth uh, and the need to create uh, more capacity in our healthcare system. We've relaxed regulation so that um, you know, if you want to get a facility fee to provide care in a parking lot in Dorchester, you can do that. Uh, and that means birthing centers are more viable all of a sudden. Uh, if you, uh, you know, we've been calling for more virtual access to care and telehealth forever, but now that we're paying for it at parity, all of a sudden, overnight, large health systems started to make these investments. So I think there are a lot of long-standing things 
Oh, and on top of it, um, it has brought every social inequity in society, thrown it to a pressure cooker and, and just, just tossed it into stark relief. Uh, it's not just a demand for these services has gone up, it's that the moral imperative to finally address them uh, has become so strong. So I think that that's the that's way of trying to be hopeful mm. and, and saying that I think there are a lot of longstanding innovations that people have known needed to take place for a long time that are finally begin, be, becoming to, uh, starting to take hold and particularly when it comes to serving the most vulnerable. Awesome. Well, thanks for taking the time. I think you just got paged out. Is that correct? Are you with us for, okay. So Neil just got paged. He has to go deliver some babies and, um, and take care of people. So Tamar, um, you know, I'd, I'd love to talk more with you about sort of the care model that you've designed as well. Um, you know, we know that um, more than half of the, the births and the, the, the deaths, um, more than half of the deaths and the morbidity happens after birth. And so can you tell us a little bit about 42 days and why, what's, what that's addressing? Yeah, that's, uh, that's kind of my, my newest focus right now is, is what do we, what can we offer to keep that connection um, going and that kind of information sharing going after somebody is discharged from the hospital. But at this time, as you're mentioning, that's, that's still fairly high risk where you may be, you know, as a, as a new um, parent, you may confuse some of the symptoms that you're experiencing with just the exhaustion and headaches of being a new parent and being sleep deprived and, and um, having to focus all your energy on keeping somebody else alive um, and kind of not thinking about yourself so much. So 42 days is really kind of extending the, the model with my healthy pregnancy to, to check in and really focus on maternal health um, and kind of offer reassurance about what's normal and support, but also help kind of tease out those risk factors that can sometimes be hidden. So things like postpartum preeclampsia, which could be confused easily with some of the symptoms of just being wiped out, <laughs> try and really highlight some of those and share information in a way that's actionable for patients when they're not seeing their physician or their midwife as frequently as they were before. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting to the, to the point that Neil was making around the policy and the systems. It's, you know, we talk about Medicaid, um, you know, Medicaid runs out for, you know, 60 days after birth. And what we're seeing is, you know, it's around that time when birthing people and pregnant people um, who are new new parents actually need the healthcare system the most. And so, you know, so if there are policy changes that address these coverage pieces, then there's going to need, we're going to need those delivery system models like, you know, fourth trimester and, you know, potential other technology tools that can that can make those linkages. That that's that's fantastic. Um, Bethany, can you tell us a little bit more about um, your, your, your thoughts around um, what's the return on investment to society by investing in the, in the right things? What are, what are the right things? Yeah, well, um, I mean, I think there's, there's lots of things, right? And I know we're running a little bit short on time, but I think one of the things um, that I'm most excited about is, is really this um, ability and continued trend for women innovating for women. And I think that we're at a point in society where there are more female entrepreneurs, there are more, you know, designers and engineers and scientists and business leaders who are women now. And that allows us and it affords us these opportunities to be able to design and commercialize products that, you know, haven't previously been engineered by women um, and they haven't really met our needs appropriately because those designers were kind of missing the firsthand experience that, that we're able to now really bring to the table and quickly innovate on. And, and that in and of itself will really start to allow um, you know, some of the underserved um, communities the ability to help decide and direct what to invest in, what problems we wanna solve and how to best to solve them because in, in a big way, we are helping to create this change by creating products for those who are underserved, right? And as creators, you're purchasing these products and inherently we're starting to change the flow of money and our positions in society and be able to really as a whole weigh in on what should we be investing in next and bringing new voices to the table as a result of that change in the flow of money. 
Absolutely. I've been really excited about the growth of women-led companies, of um, women-led investing firms, and also of, um, of, of women of color starting companies as well. And so that, that's really exciting. So we have a minute and a half. Um, so, you know, I'd love to end off on a positive note. This is about sort of looking to 2030. So what, what brings you, you both hope? Um, what are you most optimistic about looking forward to 2030? So Tamar, then Bethany? Sure. Um, well, right now, our incoming government administration brings me great hope. Um, you know, I'm counting on Kamala Harris with all of the kind of focus she's put on maternal health uh, to keep that going um, and hope that there'll be kind of more behavioral scientists playing a role in maternal health care policy. Um, but I think, you know, Bethany said it really beautifully just now. I'm, I'm kind of really optimistic that as technology and science progresses, there's gonna be more control put back in the hands of pregnant people. Um, the pendulum will swing back, but just supported by innovation. And, um, you know, people know their bodies better than anyone. I'm also really optimistic just sitting here that, you know, our, our remaining three panelists are, are female leaders. And, you know, by 2030, maybe that won't even be worthy of observation because <laughs> we'll, be, we'll be shifting things, so. Thank you, yeah. thank you very much. Yeah. Bethany, yeah. what are your thoughts? Yeah, I absolutely agree. And I think that this, um, you know, this intersection of, you know, the, what the pandemic has brought on has kind of forced this diffusion of innovation on, um, you know, self-inquiry uh, and this ability to kind of facilitate and open up more informed conversations about our bodies and our health, which should inherently break down some taboos and allow us to, you know, experience the shift in societal understanding that allows, um, you know, a collective recognition that what is good for women's health and women's well-being is also good for all genders and society as a whole. And so, you know, that's one of the things that, that I'm additionally pretty excited about. Fantastic. I agree. Well, thank you both, um, Bethany and Tamar. And thanks to Neil, who had to run. Um, really excited about our conversation today. You know, I think there's a lot to, to think about and hope for for 2030. So we should, you know, circle back in, in 10 years and replay this on Zoom and just check off where, where all of you were, were right. So thanks and very excited about this conversation. Look forward to continuing the, 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 the conversation. Thanks. Thank you guys. It was a pleasure, guys.